Okay, thank you very much all for coming here. Today is a seminar from uh, Eva Maria Grefe from Imperial College. And she's talking about uh, quantum physics, more or less. <laughs> and so some of the physicists were really happy. Some of the fun mathematicians may be concerned about that. But uh, yeah, the floor is about yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bati. Thank you very much for having me here. It's really nice. I don't know, everyone says the same, but it's really nice speaking in front of real people <laughs> again. And some, yeah, some real people who are behind the screen, I guess. I don't know, are there any real people behind screens here? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm a quantum um, mechanic in, in the maths department, so I'm really a physicist in exile. I've been in the maths department <laughs> at Imperial for, for many years. It's, it's rubbed off a little bit, but, but not that much. So I think um, I like to think of it the way that I didn't really get more mathematical, I just became less applied. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, anyway. So for I think for those of you who deal with, with proper PDEs, this year will all be quite an, a nice sort of, you know, it looks a bit like an undergraduate exercise probably, because as you know, quantum mechanics is linear, right? So everything I'm doing here is still linear, but what I'm interested in is um, non-hemission Hamiltonians generating quantum theory. And yeah, that's what I'm going to spend the next few, um, I was just going to say the next few hours. <laughs> <laughs> next, um, half an hour, 40 minutes or so telling you about. So I've been obsessed with non-emission quantum physics um, for, for many years. And um, I've been, it, it's kind of, I just want to give you a bit of a background of why I'm, I'm speaking about this here. So in particular about the quantum and classical correspondence. And I thought that some way, you know, maybe 15 years ago or so that I kind of was beginning to understand what's going on there. And was thinking a lot about coherent states moving around in phase space. But somehow this year I've been looking into with my PhD student Kate and my other PhD student Rasim and one of my postdoc Simon's, so a lot of people who gathered around that in the meantime. We've been looking into something which I actually thought was a little exercise, as I just said, to get used to non-emission physics, but also to some phase space methods we're doing. And so far, I have been doing everything in phase space using Gaussian states and Wigner functions. I don't know whether some of you use them or not. They will actually not feature here. And sometimes people ask me what happens if you do the same thing with the Huzimi function, which I will be talking about. And if you don't know what it is, I will give you one slight introduction of what it is. And I was thinking, well, you would probably pr get pretty much the same. But now we've been calculating through these examples, and they're all very basic and simple. But it made me realize some aspects of this dynamics that I totally haven't been thinking about the last 15 or 20 years, thinking about these things, strangely. Um, maybe not quite 20, 15. <laughs> um, so I think this is actually all quite simple, but I think it's actually the, a very nice way to think about how the dynamics generated by non-emission Hamiltonians is different from the dynamics generated by Hermitian Hamiltonians and how one can kind of easily see a classical analog of what they're doing. And I think in particular for those of you who have more of a PDE and wave mindset, that might be a very natural way of thinking about that. So, um, yeah, it never does what you expect it to do and when you're on this presenting mode. So there's just a brief outline. These look even more psychedelic in this color scheme here than on my screen. <laughs> anyway, so. First, I want to tell you a little bit about non-emission quantum mechanics. I, I've been recently giving a whole course on that. So, you know, I really do not want to go to this few hours that I've been just almost saying. I only want to tell you something about that for maybe 10 minutes or so the most. And obviously I can't say everything, but just to give you a bit of a motivation of where this sort of idea comes from to use non-emission operators to generate quantum dynamics and um, what the sort of <laughs> questions are. And then I will just talk about the Huzimi distribution, which is I, I wrote in the title phase space. And you know, there are lots of other ways to do phase space in quantum mechanics. It's not um it's not obvious how one can talk about phase space at all in quantum mechanics, but the Huzimi distribution is one of the traditional ways of trying to do that, and it's quite useful to compare to classical systems. And so I will just give you a brief um, intro to this of Huzimi distributions, starting from coherent states and show you how they move around for 
anharmonic and harmonic oscillators. And then I will move on to this non-emission Fusimi dynamics. I mean, the dynamics is non-unitary, really. What I mean is dynamics generated by non-emission um, Hamiltonian. And we'll try to highlight what I think is the underlying structure of this. OK, let's start with, uh, with a few words on non-emission physics. So of course, well, you know, many of you may have not done quantum for a while, but the first thing you teach in quantum mechanics and you, you learn is that um, quantum mechanics is a theory of emission operators. So normally in quantum mechanics, you describe small isolated systems and they're not in contact with their environment in the traditional setup. So while in Newtonian physics, you have things like friction, a quantum physicist, they have this strong belief in unitarity. Energy is always conserved when you just take everything into account. And in a quantum description, in traditional way, a Hamiltonian, which is the energy operator of the system, it generates the dynamics that is required to be a Hermitian operator, meaning that all the eigenvalues of that Hamiltonian are real and the time evolution will be unitary and there's no probability lost and there's no features like friction or damping, right? But of course, that is already the, the idea. I say this of moving a bit different from what I expect. So um, that's already the motivation of actually making um, the theory non-hemission if you do not want that, if you do want damping and dissipation. And I did say in traditional quantum theory that's not done, but actually the, um, the idea of using complex energies to describe an effective decay or absorption um, is actually as old as, as the Schrodinger description of quantum theory almost. So Schrodinger's equation, I think, came about in um, 26, roughly, and George Gamow already in 28 used the idea of complex energies to describe a leaking system or a decay in that case, an alpha mm -hmm. case, so the decay of an alpha particle out of a of a nucleus. So the idea there is that, um, yeah, I don't have um, an equation here, but so in in um, in Schrödinger dynamics, right, because it's linear. So if you have an eigenstate with an energy E, then the over time that state would just evolve in the phase E. But if E is complex what you get can be either an exponential growth or an exponential decay of this overall norm. And the overall norm in the quantum system, we associate to the probability of our system being somewhere at all. So in this case, if you think about a particle, then if you don't think it's spontaneously disappearing, then this norm overall should be conserved, right? It can move around in your system, but it shouldn't go down or up. But if you only look at a finite system, and um, for example, just this room, right? Then of course the probability of you staying in here could go down. Right? That depends on the quality of the talk part. <laughs> but um, so here in this case of the alpha decay, you're thinking about the nucleus as your system, and the proto uh, the alpha particle could be in there or not. And the probability for it to be in there is actually experimentally going down exponentially in time. That's at least the assumption that most physicists work with and that, for example, all our carbon-based um, dating is based on the assumption that is to a very good approximation and exponential decay. So a complex <laughs> energy gives you exactly that. If you have a quantum eigenstate with a complex energy, if the imaginary part is negative, you get an exponential decay in time. And that's what Gamow suggested using to describe um, finite lifetime states, states that decay and that don't live forever. Also in, in spectroscopy, <laughs> these imaginary parts of energy so are usually linked to the width of a line. So in a theory where you have infinitely stable states, then you just have um, delta peaks in a spectroscopy, um, in a spectrum. Right? But in real life, you're going to have broad lines and that's linked to a lifetime. So in that theory, um, complex energies have been used sort of as an effective way to use decay or describe decay for a long time. Um, but people didn't go further than that. They didn't say, well, actually, to have complex energies, we need a non-hemission operator in the first place, right? Because a hemission operator will only give us real energies. And if the operator is actually not hemission, there's much more going on than just complex eigenvalues, because other things are so the main thing is that the eigenvectors of non-hermitian operators are not 
aren't usually orthogonal to each other. And that leads to much bigger differences than just decay overall. But nevertheless, the idea was there. I think what kind of made the uh, field much bigger in recent decades, actually, is this field of PT symmetric quantum theories. And some of you probably have heard about that, where you take a quantum, an operator that isn't, that's not Hermitian, but that has another symmetry. And that other symmetry will can lead to it. Well, I say another symmetry. Hermeticity isn't actually a symmetry, strictly speaking. So it's a bit muddled up in that field. But an uh, operator that's not Hermitian, but that has a certain <laughs> anti-linear symmetry that makes it have all real eigenvalues. And there the idea was that you can then use these systems to still describe closed quantum systems. That has sort of gone a slightly different way in the meantime, but it made the field quite interesting because in particular these PT symmetric non-Hermitian systems can have quite interesting features. They're often sort of on the boundary between dissipative and conservative behavior. And um, so for me, um, it doesn't actually really matter too much where this is coming from. But the main thing I've been just saying that is that this traditional view was that all of that is very similar to emission things, but you have an overall decay or growth and other nothing else changes. But this is, of course, not the case. And I think this has been made particularly obvious by PT symmetric systems. So let me just talk about PT symmetry a tiny bit, just because it's something that comes up a lot in the literature these days. And that I will have an example that's PT symmetric if I ever get there. <laughs> so I'm not running out of time before. So this idea is that originally the name PT comes from the idea that um, when people started thinking about that, it was sort of associated to parity and time reversal symmetry. But in the meantime, usually it's um, used a bit more freely. I didn't actually add a reference here. So there are lots of people have been thinking about that in different ways. So the term PT in particular has been coined by Bender and co-workers, but other people have used other concepts like that for longer, um, like pseudo-hermeticity, quasi-hermeticity, there are all sorts of words for it. So the idea is that if you have an operator, which isn't necessarily Hermitian, but it has an anti-unitary symmetry, it can have purely real eigenvalues. Maybe that's not surprising, right? Just because it's not Hermitian doesn't mean it can't have real eigenvalues. But instead of talking about abstractly, let me just give you a very simple example. So let's look at these two levels system here. In quantum system, what you would think about that is there are two modes. Um, I'm sorry, those online can't actually see what I'm pointing at, but there's the, the slide is reasonably sparse, so probably it's okay. So one mode, um, the, when you're in that mode here, the lower one, the population decays exponentially. And when you're in the upper mode, the population grows exponentially. So you can think of that as some sort of decay mechanism. The growth mechanism isn't very physical in quantum physics, but if you think about other wave physics, like light, optical setups, you can have a laser medium where for, for short times before you saturate, you have approximately exponential growth. But then these two modes are coupled with a coupling constant V, right? So this model here is PT symmetric, the Hamiltonian, with respect where the p is the interchange of the two levels so that's parity for you they're just two levels one and two and it's like flipping them is like a parity operation and um, the t operator turns the sign of i around in this simple model it can do a bit more in other models but in our model it's simply a complex conjugation that's where it's anti-unitary right it's not a linear operator um complex conjugation it's an anti-linear operator because it flips the sine of i. So if you interchange the two modes, but you flip the sine of i, you get out with the same Hamiltonian again. That's the PT symmetry of that. You can also view it as a loss and gain balance. So there, there's the same rate for the decay as for the growth, and they're sort of symmetrically coupled. And what happens in this model is that the eigenvalues here are real as long as the magnitude of gamma, this decay loss, loss gain parameter, is smaller than the magnitude of the coupling. But when it goes larger than the coupling, you have two complex conjugate eigenvalues. So that's very typical for these PT symmetric systems. The eigenvalues are either real or come in complex conjugate pairs. So a simplest example of these are actually <laughs> real matrices that aren't symmetric. Um, they always either have real eigenvalues or complex conjugate because their characteristic polynomial is real, right? So all of these would be PT symmetric just with a funky P operator. You have to construct it for every model. So this model here is an is an example of 
PT symmetry. And let me just show you how one could implement that in a lab. And people have done that many times. In the meantime, they've also done it with actually quantum physics, where they've done this sneaky bit where we get rid of the loss, uh, the gain, because it's a bit hard to do experimentally, even though in the meantime, they've done gain and loss with light. But with atoms, they only done the lossy bit because it's it's an argument whether or not you can actually have a coherent gain in a quantum wave function. So most people argue you can't. But this year is still passively PT symmetric, what it's called. So it's up to a gauge transformation. That's just a fancy word. So up to an overall decay of e to the minus gamma t. This has the same behavior as the PT model we saw before. And you can, for example, build that in classical optics, I'm not talking quantum optics, just classical optics by two waveguides. So this is my upper waveguide and my lower waveguide here. One of them has loss, the other one doesn't, um, or it has much less loss than this one here. And they're close to each other, so they're ever essentially coupled, light can go back and forth, right? And there's only one mode in each of these waveguides, they're single mode waveguides, yeah? They're a very simple system. So light can be either sitting in here or it sits in here and it propagates through. So the question is, what happens if you put light into this upper waveguide? Um, and there's some false color picture here where it's very red, there's lots of light, and where in this blue there's little light. So actually what you see first, if you just look at pictures like that, where it propagates over the propagation distance here, so this should maybe be below, that might make more sense. So it starts in this upper one, it goes into the lower and goes back and forth. In fact, that looks just like the permission one just with an overall damping. So it looks as if there isn't actually that much interesting happening. But if you look a bit more in the details, that's not quite the case. And one nice thing that has been looked at both um, also experimentally, which sort of convinces people sometimes that non-hermission is quite different from emission, is if you ask the question about what's the transmission through this structure as a function of the loss. Yeah. So what I'm going to do for a given length, it's actually the same, you know, pretty much the same curve for different length. It's just different actual scales. So I'm putting light into this loss-free one. You know, it's going to typically start oscillating back and forth. Whenever it's in the lossy one, it's going to be absorbed. So the naive assumption would be that the more loss there is, the less transmission, right? So there's less light coming out on that side. And that's true up to a point. But then at some point, you know, you increase the loss and there's hardly any light coming through. But then you increase the loss more and there's more light coming through again. <laughs> and asymptotically, that will actually go, well, not quite up. Well, it will asymptotically go back up to one again. But that depends. Um, the details depend on the length of the structure and so forth. This is sort of theory and experiment. This isn't a very sophisticated theory. This is a two by two system, right? So it's something that really is an undergraduate exercise. So you just take the exponential of this matrix and you have your time evolution operator and you calculate what's the probability here. But what happens physically is that at this point, that's what we call an exceptional point, which is where gamma equals V, that's when the modes, the eigenvalues change. They go from real to complex conjugate. Actually, by the way, yeah, so in this where this goes down with the loss, you know, that's all this sort of these two eigenvalues are actually still real, but there's an overall decay there, right? And when that happens, what, what happens is that these two eigenmodes lose their symmetry. So up to this point, when gamma is large, when gamma is smaller than V, every eigenmode has to be symmetric between these two waveguides. So it has to be basically half-half and then some phase, right? But when that happens, because PT symmetry isn't a proper symmetry, it's an anti-unitary symmetry, the eigenfunctions do not have to respect that symmetry. And they won't anymore if that um, gamma is too large. And what happens then is that you have one mode which sits up here and another which sits up here, and they don't talk to each other anymore. Which basically means maybe it's not so unphysically. If you have lots of loss in here, you just decouple these two waveguides, and this evanescent coupling is just not happening anymore. So what's then happening is it just stays in that one without loss. right? And that explains this. But the reason I've been dwelling on that is more to show you that this is completely not just the same as what happens without the loss in an overall decay. There's just effects that are unique to the fact that you have loss in your system. And this one is something people use for, for optical diodes and switches and various things. 
Um, and, you know, people have been building a lot of stuff with PT symmetric things. So here's my PT symmetry and lossy system slide where I'm just kind of flagging up a few things. So this PT in optics and had been highlighted um, by Nature Physics. It's already seven years ago that that came out in this top 10 physics discoveries. So it was this party time symmetry. There were, there were lots of fun things. If you haven't seen that um, cartoon, is quite fun. There's the Higgs bison, and um, there's also the neutrinos faster than light, and then well, obviously not faster than light. I think that was the number 11 or something. Anyway, so you can do all sorts of things. Don't ask me about them. I don't know about them, but these are applications people have built with PT symmetry. They make better lasers. They make all sorts of stuff in acoustics. They do things about preventing earthquakes. A lot of things that maybe you know much more than I know by kind of having this, this layered absorptions in, in places. Up here is a picture of a Bose-Einstein condensate from um, Herbig Ott's group. They were in Mainz when they made that picture but then Kaiser's out there now, and they've been removing, it's not super clear, but they removed um, atoms deliberately from certain um, places in the lattice to carve the Schrodinger equation into here. This is H psi is E psi. Um, and this is an example of controlled losses in, in this system. So they're using the losses to, to deplete certain lattice sites. Um, this is more on the fundamental side, but you know, there's lots happening in non-hemission systems, uh, even though they're probably not a purist quantum description of quantum phenomena. Right, um, let me move on to Husini distributions, something actually quite different, but then obviously I'm going to try to bring it together, unless there are questions up to here, apart from the applications. <laughs> no? yeah. So let me move on then. So, so I quite like quantum classical correspondence in phase space. It's potentially just a personal preference, but it, it's been something that, that's been attracting attention from the early years of quantum mechanics. It, it seems a nice way to, to look at quantum classical correspondence. So we often start by teaching quantum mechanics simply in, in um, configuration space. So you have a psi of x, the Schrodinger function, but you completely disregard the information about the momentum. And in particular, in quantum mechanics, position and momentum, you know, everything is Hamiltonian. You know, we're really doing the equivalent of Hamiltonian classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. So P and Q are on equal footing, really. It's quite useful to get information about P and Q at the same time. Sadly, or maybe not sadly, because that's in some ways the root of all quantum phenomena that we use in a lot of technologies, and the uncertainty principle prohibits us from actually talking about position and momentum in a defined way at the same time. So the concept of a phase space point really is a tricky one in quantum mechanics because of this, because P and Q do not commute. And so it matters which one you apply first, right? So you can't really, this, this, this typical thing, right? If you do measure position first, then you lose all information about momentum. If you measure momentum first, you lose all information about position. You can get around that with weak measurements, but you can never pin it down um, to, to an actual phase space point where um, you have more certainty than H bar. So the best you can do is a Planck cell in phase space, really. So that's sort of the, that's minimum uncertainty states where the uncertainty of position and momentum are both of the order of h bar. Let's put it that way. They actually square root of h bar, so the product is of the order of h bar. But you can do use this concept of coherent states, and <coughs> maybe I'm overusing quantum notation if you haven't been looking at quantum for a while. But these guys, A and A dagger, they are the creation and annihilation operators of a harmonic oscillator. So in a harmonic oscillator in quantum, you probably remember we have the um, discrete um, equidistant eigenstates, right? And the A and A dagger go up and down the ladder. And um, a coherent state is a displacement of a ground state of a, of a harmonic oscillator. So it's basically the harmonic oscillator ground state is minimum uncertainty. It's as close to a phase space point as you can get. And if you now move that to any other space and any other point in phase space, then you can kind of say that's sort of the concept of a phase space point. And this Rosimi distribution, um, even though it wasn't introduced as in that way originally by, but he's actually called Fushimi, by um, the Japanese um, 
fear theories actually for Shimi. Um, he introduced it as a smoothing over the Wigner function. But if you do know Wigner, then maybe that's what you've heard about. But let's not talk about Wigner functions at all. You can view this Rosini distribution as an expansion of any quantum state into this overcomplete basis of coherent states. So if you if these coherent states were orthogonal, ortho, sorry, orthogonal basis, then obviously these would be just the coefficients the probability of measuring this particular coherent state. But they're not orthogonal, they're overcomplete. You know, they have overlaps with each other, right? There's like a little blob sitting in each point, but it's a bit, it spreads out to other points nearby. Um, so this one here gives you a probability distribution in phase space, and it's strictly positive and it's normalizable. And that's great because it's quite similar to the concept of a classical probability distribution in phase space. It's not fulfilling all the theorems that you would expect from a classical probability distribution. Um, actually, let me show you an example and then you can see one of the things it doesn't do instantly. So here are the harmonic oscillator eigenstates and um, the equation for the Rosimi function for each of them is just given down here. And here I show you a false color plot again. I maybe it should have been looking from the side as a surface, but this one here, the ground set is a Gaussian e to the minus z squared sitting at the center. And then the higher excited state, I think this is the third, and no, this is the second, and this is the fifth excited state. Um, they are just rings. They're rings shaped around the, the origin. And one thing you can see is that if you integrate over p or if you integrate over q, you actually do not get the, the probability distribution of p or q out of that. So these marginal distributions that you're quite used to classically, you have this probability distribution of p and q, you integrate out q, so you get the probability in p, you integrate out p, you get the probability in q, that doesn't work, okay? So that's the one thing. So it's not exactly like a classical probability distribution, yeah? But it still gives you a notion of how likely, you know, how much particle is sitting or your quantum state is localized around a certain point in phase space. Okay. Yes? Yeah, so, the states from what I know about them is that they are non number conserving, I think. So, they've been used for light a lot of things. Yes. I'm just wondering how transferable these ideas to atoms, for example. Yes. Where you have Yes. Number, number. So it depends a bit on what your modes are. So the sort of in they they so Glauber introduced the coherent states in in quantum optics, and there is about photons and these different states, the end states, the one that A and A dagger got on, they are number states of at the photons. How many photons do you have, right? And in this you get exactly this distribution, in fact, um the Poissonian distribution, I believe, of the different um numbers. But this could be, of course. If it's just a classical harmonic oscillator, you could think about one particle and the distribution is of the different energy states, right? So it's a, it's a state for a single particle, but it's a distribution, you know, the, it's a ground state or something else, right? And in cold atoms, that's actually not, not atypical. So we wouldn't necessarily think about this N as the number of particles in there, but well, we could, right? That, that happens as well. Um, <laughs> But there are other states that are more suitable for for cold atoms, for example. Well, it depends really in which of the, you know, it is true that if you think of atoms, you think more that you can count them one by one. But, you know, whether that's true or not depends on your experimental setup, obviously, right? So it depends in which canonical ensemble you're actually talking. So there are some setups where it's actually not clear until you measure the particle number how many you really have. But if you do have a setup with a fixed particle number, there are other coherent states for other algebras that have that as a constraint. So that's SUM coherent states for something with M modes and a fixed number of particles. They're kind of nicer, actually. I prefer them. We haven't finished this for SUN. I don't think it's different, but I've said that before with <laughs> Emil Wigner as well, um, because they live on a compact phase space. So this particle number conservation um, would then be, so I say compact because the simplest case is a sphere. Um, it can be a higher dimensional sphere. So the conservation then leads to the fact that your space isn't infinite. So this space here of Q and P goes all the way to infinity and you have this long tail, you know, it's a Gaussian, so you don't see it here, but really it's non-zero probability all the way to infinity, right? 
So if you have this fixed particle number, you can actually incorporate that by using other coherent states that belong to other algebras. So these coherent states here, the Glauber coherent states, they're the algebra of this harmonic oscillator. It's really just the translation algebra on the, on the plane, right? So this guy here is just taking this state and then it's moved to another point. But you can use SUM to rotate them on um, compact manifolds. And then you also get other coherent states. And you can use the nice thing about the Rosimi is you can use the same ideas. So Wigner functions, for example, are harder. You can do them for anything as well, but they're harder to do for other algebras. And Rosimi, as soon as you have a set of coherent states, you can apply it, right? Because you can define it in that way. Right. So um, harmonic oscillator Rosimi flow, just as a quick warm up. Um, this is the harmonic oscillator, you know, which is. Um, P squared plus Q squared in, in the canonical coordinates or A dagger A in these creation and relation operators. So if we take the Schrödinger equation for this system, we can directly translate into equation of motion for the Husimi function. And that's actually a Liouville equation. So that's kind of nice. I mean, it's a complex one because I use Z and Z star. You can use P and Q if you prefer. And you can see it's, it's really simple. It basically just says that Q dot is the Q dp p dot plus dq dq q dot right and then the p and the q they just move according to classical dynamics so the solution of that for this system is simply that whatever Husimi function you start out with you just rotate your space rigidly below that and basically your Husimi function is transported along the classical dynamics for that i didn't make a video maybe i should have but i just have some snapshots so up here is um, a coherent state moved to some initial phase space point, and then from the right, left to the right, the time evolves in the white line shows you where it has been on the way. <laughs> so it just rotates around this circle in a rigid rotation. Here's a higher excited state also moved out because the stationary states, they don't move at all, obviously. So I move them away from the origin so that they start rotating. And the quantum motion of this is exactly like the classical motion. There's no difference for harmonic oscillators. For unharmonic systems, of course, quantum is different from classics. Yeah, but this classical structure can still help you to understand what happens. So let me, yeah. Does omega depend on the state? No. So this here is just, yeah, it's just a very simple harmonic oscillator. So they, they all have the same frequency. Yeah. So what we're doing now is, is a standard example. Actually, I mean, Milburn didn't invent it. It's, it's kind of often called the Kerr Hamiltonian for, um, in quantum optics, but it's just an unharmonic oscillator. It has an x squared plus p squared to the power of two. And Milburn in 86, actually, a while ago, um, when he was actually a postdoc at Imperial, um, it, I, I didn't actually realize that until I read that paper. Um, so he was looking at what the Husimi function does for that. I think he didn't actually know that it was called the Husimi function. The name doesn't appear in the paper. But um, so what happens classically in that system is that, of course, you know, it's integrable, right? It's just the harmonic oscillator plus the square of the harmonic oscillator, right? So the, the orbits are still circles, <laughs> but of course, they all have different frequencies now. So that's sort of a bit different here now. This one oscillates with one frequency, but the higher up you go, the frequency goes up with your radius, right? So even though an individual particle or a classical trajectory would just go on a circle, if you move a distribution, it does more than that. So now I actually want this to start first. That's the classical one. So classically, what would happen if you propagate the Husimi function? Uh, this is, you know, a classical propagation. It just spirals out over these worlds. Over, yeah, it, it, it reaches the resolution of that I've been taking here in phase space. So because some of them. Let me start it again. So in the very beginning, right, some of the orbits are faster, the further out ones than the other ones, right? And it just spreads along this thinner and thinner whirl in phase space, right? And the quantum, the full quantum evolution actually doesn't do that because that actually has interference on top. Let me show you what the full quantum evolution is doing. So that starts just like the classical Husimi, but then it encounters its own tail and it interferes with itself. And it makes these nice interference structures. And you can see, so these times are actually units of pi, I should say. And I use the beta, which is one quarter. So after four pi, it will actually come back to its original state. 
and in between you can see it gets like various copies of itself and at 2 pi there are two copies of the initial state here from the interference effect but you can clearly see how this sort of spiraling for short time structures this flow but obviously once the distribution encounters itself it will start interfering and that's good because quantum you know we like quantum effects right but you can sort of see you know optically they don't look that similar anymore but you can see how the classical structure guides it and how the interference effects on top of that lead to that and obviously these interference effects will take longer and longer um, the, the smaller your h bar is in this case here i didn't actually use an h bar it's um, depending on how far out you're away from the origin so these interference effects um, only appear at later times yes okay so that's permission for zimi uh, unitary Hosimi evolution in phase space for you. So let me just take 10 minutes and do the same thing with non emission Yeah. Okay, let's start out with a very simple warm up exercise in the um, complex harmonic oscillator. So this isn't very physical, I think. <laughs> but I just plugged in, you know, being, in, I took the liberty being in the math department of just making the energy complex, the frequency complex. You know, why not? See what happens. Um, so this one here still has the same eigenstates as the Hermitian problem, making it very special among non-Hermitian operators because it's still a normal operator. It, the eigenvectors are all orthogonal, so half of the, the complications for non-Hermitian systems are already removed. It's only about this complex energy is what happens here. And if you look at the equation of motion for the Husini function, you see there's a complex frequency now, but you also have the constant term here. So this is now a Liouville equation, which has an explicit time dependent in Q. In fact, this should probably be a, um, a total derivative, and then this should be interpreted as the explicit um, time derivative. Um, so the differential equation just gets this extra term, which sort of looks really innocent, but if you do PDEs, probably it's not at all surprising what it does. If you're kind of relying on a physical intuition where you think about particles going around trajectories, <laughs> it's sort of a bit surprising what it does. So what it leads to is that the initial Husimi distribution is transported along some trajectories, which strangely actually, um, so if this gamma here is negative, which you associate with a damping, then in fact, this one here will go out. It will spiral outwards rather than inwards. But then there's an overall term here, which comes from this term, where the norm, it has to do with the fact that the norm of the quantum state decays depending where you start. And this one here conspires together with this to make everything go inwards. But it will look different for different initial distributions. And I just show you a few snapshots again. So for a coherent state again, as before, it sort of spirals in. You can hardly see it's not a very large damping I've been taking here. I didn't even tell you the parameters. I took um, gamma 0.1 and omega as 1. And then before it goes around once, it starts getting dumped in. But if you take another initial state, you see it deforms along the way and it follows a completely different trajectory. So this is sort of not normally in the harmonic oscillator, everything does the same. You know, the coherent state moves along there and every other state also. But here in this system, actually, we know where it wants to end because we know at in, it, you know, in the limit of infinite times, only one of these eigenstates survives. They all decay with different rates, and one has the slowest decay, and that's where everything goes, and that's the ground state. So eventually, everything will want to look like a Gaussian sitting at zero, but they all take different routes to get there. And you see the fact that eventually everything looks like a Gaussian going to zero. You can see that in here. So this one will decay. And so initially it's not there, it's one minus one, right? But then it will decay and it's just going to give you an e to the minus z squared sitting at the center and it's multiplied with something which kind of still somewhere, actually it just goes out to infinity, the rest of it. So it's basically a constant function. It's a very small constant function, but it's still a constant where this Gaussian sits. Yeah, so for harmonic oscillator, not surprisingly, all that is easy to, to solve analytically and to talk about. But to me, that was actually something, even though I had been thinking about non-emission quantum physics for a long time, I hadn't actually, I was talking to a colleague um, who had been working on it for a long time too and said, oh, it's funny how these different states all take different trajectories. And he was like, no, they don't. I said, 
well, you know, I mean, maybe it's just this particular colleague, but I think a lot of people who've been working with non-emission for a while still we haven't really seen some of the very basic aspects because we've been thinking only about coherent states, for example. We never look about how you know how other states move. So um, I wanted that to change, and now we want to kind of look at what happens in a generic system. But of course, we can't. I mean, we can't necessarily do that in full glory. But let's just say to start with, we look at the equation of the Hosimi function here that just comes. For a pure state, if, if Q is a pure state psi, then it looks like this, and where K now is a Hamiltonian. I call it K just to distinguish it for a Hermitian one. Um, the K is, is going to be, um, I think of it as H minus or H plus I gamma or something. So what we're going to do is we assume that it's normal ordered. If it's not normal ordered, you know, meaning that all the A daggers are on the left and all the A's are on the right, you have to go through a potentially tedious step first. <laughs> For these quartic oscillators, it's fine, but if you have other functions, it might be tedious, but it's not um, its not really a loss of generality, it's just making life easier. And if you plug that in, then you get this equation of motion, which, you know, we don't, it's not actually a function of Q yet on this side. But it turns out um, there's such a thing as the algebra that, that's to do with the um, properties of coherent states, that if you have Structures like these, you can express them as differential operators acting on the classical functions, the expectation values in Korean states. So this F here, I forgot to write it, is the expectation value of the operator F in, in a coherent state set. So this is a phase space function, and you can rewrite these things. And looking at this, you can see <laughs> that this here really is a higher order differential equation for the Husimi function, but it potentially goes up to infinite order. It depends on how high the orders of your k go. So for a harmonic oscillator, it's just a linear differential equation. But um, sorry, not linear. It's a first order. But if these guys go up higher, you get higher and higher derivatives in here. But what you can do is you can now look at the leading orders in this semi-classical parameter z. I'm, I'm rushing through this. I'm going to show you another video <laughs> in a moment. That's probably nicer. Um, you can ask about, you know, what are the leading orders? And somehow the argument you're making now is that this is a differential equation of potentially very high orders, but the coefficients of the higher orders will get lower in this parameter z. So z is actually how far away are you from your origin, which is sort of the old fashioned way of thinking about semi-classics. So for large quantum numbers, when you're far away, when you have microscopic Q and P, then things start looking classical, right? And it's, it's always tricky, uh, you know PDEs, um, to just argue that because the coefficient is small, we can just neglect the whole term. But um, it's what you could start doing. And if you do that in the Hermitian case, you get the classical Leo will flow as an answer, right? If you do it in the non-Hermitian case, you make this approximation and you get an equation for this classical Husimi function, which is now the same as I did for the harmonic oscillator just with a general Hamiltonian K. And this gamma here, I only put it in, in the next slide, is the imaginary part of this um, classical Hamiltonian function. So you have this extra overall damping term, and you have a complex conjugation here that you wouldn't have in a standard Liouville equation. But looking at this equation, and sorry, this here is the gamma, um, you can just solve it the same way you solved it before. Um, with your ever favorite method. I mean, it's solved by just the transported Husimi equation along this, I don't know, I don't want to call them classical trajectories. If you think of that in the method of characteristics, they're your characteristic trajectories. So for gamma equals zero, they're the classical trajectories. But for gamma not equals zero, they're not the trajectories that a coherent state takes. They're actually going the opposite way. So. It's a bit tricky how to call them, but there's a set of phase space trajectories along which this is transported. And then there's this other function, this weighting function, which is like a landscape of norm that grows up on your phase space and that you multiply with, right? So this one here is the original one, say it was a Gaussian, it just stays a Gaussian, it's moved elsewhere. But then this one grows up on top. So in the harmonic oscillator, we saw this one to be a Gaussian emerging in the center, whereas this one was just moving outwards. Right, and you, you solve this function simply by 
calculate integrating the gain loss function along your trajectory. But for every initial point, not just for a point, you know, not just you're not taking one single initial point and propagating it, you have to propagate your whole space, right? And um, let me just show you this example now where we take um, this care Hamiltonian, but we make it non Hermitian. But I just wanted to show you an example which is not so typical in a sense where, where things aren't just dumped out. In the harmonic oscillator with the complex frequency, everything just goes into the center and that's it. So here I chose a PT symmetric example. In P and Q, it looks like this. So there's like a gain loss profile, not very physical. You would have to envelope that with something that goes to zero at infinity if you wanted to make that physical. But because there's a very high potential, you don't actually see the behavior at infinity. So this here is gain when it's at positive Q and it's experience loss when it's at negative Q. And it turns out because of the PT symmetry, it does not every PT symmetric system is like that, but some of them can be like this. This is actually, the trajectories of these are actually conservative and they're the same as for this simple Hamiltonian here, which is real. So in the trajectories, you don't see any gain or loss, but along the trajectories, you're accumulating intensity or losing intensity. So looking at this in that way, so the trajectories, they just like, look like, they're not circles, but they look almost like circles. You see this fixed point here is actually moved to a lower P, and then there's only one fixed point and the others keep on going round, and they're um, symmetric with respect to negative and positive Q, which basically tells you when you're looking at the norm, if you go around one of these, if you're, you, so you're going this way. So first you will gain, norm, but then you start losing it again. And on average, when you're up here again, you start end up with the same, right? So this is sort of a reflection of the PT symmetry of the system that it's not just growing or decaying, but it actually kind of oscillates. And here I showed you the norm landscape. This is a function of time. I picked a specific time, but you see the picture. If you go higher in time, it just starts whirling more and more and more in finer structures. And it's, it's nicely bounded just between minus three and three roughly. So each of these trajectories, so what I'm plotting here is if you started in this point and then you propagate that point at the final time that I've chosen here, what's the value of the norm? And then I color code that, right? So if I start here, then I would be going round and round and round. So this one here, the first going up and then down and it's always positive, right? This is why when you look up here, you actually don't see, you shouldn't be seeing any negative values along that line. Whereas in the bottom, if you start here, you're first decaying and then you're coming back and you know it's, it's always below one, right? And depending on where you are, because they have vastly different frequencies, every trajectory takes a different time to come back, well, not every, but they have a characteristic time to come back to themselves. So that's how you, this spiral structure comes up here. Right, and these two will now work together. If I set an initial um, point in here, like an initial distribution, then I would propagate it, um, the Husimi function classically with that. But while I'm doing it, I'm also multiplying with this function here, right? And that's how um, a classical dynamics for that happens. And in this case, um, it looks quite similar to the emission counterpart except that the bottom part of this spiral is, is, is not, it's sort of dumped out. And what you're seeing is you're kind of putting a lens over here and that's where the, the maxima of the, the norm function is where you can actually see what's going on. And then the quantum of course on top of that does lots of quantum things, right? It doesn't stop doing quantum things. Um, I put the epsilon equals one here and the beta is one quarter. So beta is vastly dominant still because it's with the quartic term. And it's still doing its interference. The epsilon makes it non-integrable, as you can tell, but it's it's still close to it. So it actually still does its coming back to itself, but you can see, you can only see really what unfolds in the top part where, where it's illuminated by this norm function. But trajectories. So and one thing is this here is very faster than this, because here I just solved the, the Schrodinger equation. So I just take e to the i h, I just take the exponential of the of the matrix, and I take, so here the question is the basis size, so I take a harmonic oscillator basis of like 200, 
it's much faster than calculating this because here I've been just propagating all my space and it depends on how fine structures I want. So I did like 300 by 300 on the train earlier to get you this little. <laughs> this is really also a work in progress. So to get you like a fairly nice picture, you also see I stopped it half the time because this gets so thin that you need a ridiculous resolution which, you know, it's just, just wasting energy, really, if you think about it, to just make nicer spirals, right? Um, so that's sort of a real disadvantage, I, in my mind, that um, if, you, if you don't have this term, all you need to propagate is where your wave function, where Houdini function had a maximum at the beginning. So you can do a Monte Carlo sampling, right? <laughs> you just propagate the points where it's likely to be, right? And you just follow them. That's, that's nice. But now, of course, all the other points might come become important along the way, even those where, where it was very unlikely to be to start with. So you really have to propagate all of it. And that makes it not very useful. Right? So this, I wouldn't actually at the moment kind of advertise that as a better way you know, to, to calculate the quantum evolution, not to mention the fact that there's no interference effects in there. But um, let me just let them run again. But I would kind of just argue that it's a way to to understand sort of this leading order classical behavior of it, which often guides our intuition in speaking about quantum phenomena at all. Right? You can't talk about tunneling if you don't know what the concept of a forbidden region is. Right? So you kind of need an underlying classical structure in your mind, or at least I do, <laughs> to, to even appreciate quantum effects. Um, yeah, but actually calculating them it depends on how fine your resolution is meant to be. And typically, I mean, this is a bad one, right? So in, in many systems, you just have a blob moving about. You don't need a high resolution. But all these ones, you know, chaotic things that lead, you know, or chaotic things, you know, that develop a very fine structure, you need loads. And the quantum is much faster. And of course, the quantum can't resolve any structure smaller than h bar. So even if it wanted to, and the h bar I give it here is basically the effective basis size I'm choosing. Right, you can either take a grid size or a harmonic oscillator basis that the way you cut it off, you're not offering it a choice, you know, any chance to resolve structures smaller than the h bar you give it. The Husimi function can't do that. Um, in fact, again, if someone knows Wigner functions better, that they, they can produce lots of structures that are much smaller than h bar, but Husimi can't do that. It's really bounded by that limited resolution. Um, I think I've really stretched my time, so let me just show you this summary slide, which is the same as my introductory or overview slide. So I talked about non-emission in general, a bit about Hosimi distributions, and then how they swirl around for non-emission dynamics. And with that, I think I'd just like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think we have a couple of minutes for a quick questions. Otherwise, we can have a longer discussion in the tea room in S120 where we'll have coffee and snacks and biscuits. Give us some bread. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone online is a uh, pressing question, otherwise we can. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go for it. So, so if you, also in the classical case, if you take a little point and, and just propagate it that. So can is it always a, a, a would you get a trajectory that is always periodic? So that that's unusual for the um, PT symmetric case. No, normally it's not. Unusual. Okay. Yeah. So I I was I mean it's good that I didn't give you another example because I ran out of time already. But you can see for example the complex harmonic oscillator there it doesn't do it it just spirals yeah. into the into the origin. So all the trajectories spiraling they're like damped harmonic oscillator trajectories. And typically for the non-emission ones, you have trajectories that um, that have, you know, the, the dynamical system would have um, sinks and sources, right? And it wouldn't have, and if it was chaotic, it would even have chaotic attractors and all these sort of things, right? It's quite atypical that it can have this conservative structure, but that can happen if it has this symmetry. And in dynamical systems, that symmetry is actually known as reversibility. Um, or time reversibility. I don't know why, because they're actually not time reversible. <laughs> so, you know, you need the P in addition, but that's how, how these systems are known. And, you know, they kind of 
as I said, a little bit between the closed and open. So they have this openness from the from the norm structure. You see that there's something else going on, but in the trajectories, if you look at them, they look like you know they're periodic. And of course, if you were be above 2D, which I don't do because I can't plot it, <laughs> um, it's maybe I shouldn't be limited by that. No, I mean of course you can look at above 2D, and then you know there's no reason why they should be periodic at all. I mean in 2D, of course, the integrable ones would be because energy is conserved. There's nothing no other degree of freedom. But if you're in higher dimension and you don't have other conserved quantities, they can go, yeah. But then if you integrate over all the points, then Q will be, the integral of Q will be conserved. Yeah, so the integral of Q is conserved. Sure. Well, no, actually, sorry, it's not. Um, but it's, um, so we have, this, <laughs> the integral of Q goes down like the overall integral of the of this W, basically. So, um, yeah, so there is a norm that decays, but in this PT symmetric case, what would happen is that it oscillates, right? So um, it it would grow basically exactly what you expect intuitively. It goes into this gain region, it grows, it goes into the decay region, it goes down again, it ends up as one for a moment, you know, and then it keeps on going up and down and up and down. Whereas in standard non-emission systems, it just exponentially decays or so goes up. Yeah, so I should have mentioned that. Yeah, so what I'm showing you, I didn't actually put the, the color bar there, but um, it constantly adjusted. So it's the, the relative distribution that I'm showing you. So the, the whole thing keeps on going up and growing. And that's actually quite, you know, because it grows exponentially and decays exponentially. If you actually left it on the same color code, you wouldn't see very much at all. Thank you. Is uh, very quick one. Okay. I mean, yeah, no, just a quick one. So on the uh, when you're looking at the non-formation uh, trajectories, you noted that they weren't circles, like they've been shifted up yeah. like in the origin plot there. And and you talked about how you had the, the gain in norm and then the loss of norm. Is there a way you can compare that gain and loss to the rate of gain and loss in the Hermitian form? You know where you had the circles. Because of course, it, I mean, obviously it's conserved because the yeah. So I, the reason I said they're not circles is they're like the contour lines of this thing, which isn't a circle. It's like p squared plus q squared, but it has the ep here. Yeah. So it's it it looks. I don't know how this thing is called. It probably has a name. It's an algebraic curve. Well, no, because it has a to the four as well. Oh. Okay. So it has p squared plus q squared plus p to the four plus two p. You know, plus ep is constant. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that, but you know, they're, they're the shape all right. Yeah. <laughs> but is there a way you can relate the, the change of norm? To, yes. To see how it changes. Yes. I mean, you know, I mean, what I tell the computer to do is literally to to follow this and integrate the uh, integrate the exponential e to the minus of this q value yeah. while you go around. So you can see it, but I find it quite difficult to see. So if you ask yourself, if I start here, you know, what's the norm after a given time? It depends on your time. I've pick, picked a fixed time here, right? So let's say here. So clearly that went around a few times, but it's somewhere in the gain region because overall it's larger than one. Whereas down here, this one is first decaying and then growing and decaying. And now it's been somewhere where it's been lower than one, right? But because this one up here goes faster, it's been going around more, but maybe it's come out to be back at one roughly, right? So, you know, it's it, I find it quite difficult to look at them and make that picture in my head. Um, but <laughs> but the, that's exactly what I tell the computer to do, right? You, you follow the trajectory and you integrate e to the minus i epsilon q along your trajectory. Okay. Yeah which is what it's doing. So it, it notices where it's going and it locally grows and decays, but you do it for every initial value. Yeah. I think it's time for a tea, coffee and biscuits. So mm -hmm. Thank you.